Hi everyone, Fide Master Dennis Montecrucis back with you again for a second look at my game with Adam Leaf from the 1985 U.S. Junior Open Championship. We looked at it last week and it looked very, very convincing and indeed it was a convincing win, certainly by the end of it for, for Leaf against me and um, you know the plot seemed quite simple. So in a Peerts I made an inaccuracy by um, not preventing him from expanding on the queen side with b5 and up his pieces or up his pawns came putting my bishop in danger putting my e4 pawn in danger i tried to complicate and while it made the game interesting and picturesque and unfortunately suitable for publication everywhere uh, ultimately he was able to rebuff my attack at a very very small material cost getting two minor pieces for a rook and two pawns but as we saw my Rook and two pawns made very little difference. What was important was his control over the center, his active uh, minor pieces, and then finally his ability to penetrate and win on the queen side. So that's how it seemed to me at the time. It's how it seemed to my opponent. And it's how it seemed to um, the annotators who looked at it as well, certainly to Peters and to, to Robert Byrne. Well, Let's take a closer look this week, and in fact, we'll see that things were far from, from being so clear. So the, uh, the moral of the story is going to be a twofold one. First of all, the, uh, well, maybe a threefold one, actually. So one is to be very careful about annotating by result. Okay, so just because one player won and the other, there were no obvious blunders, it doesn't necessarily mean that there was this logical, logical progression from start to finish, whereby the preordained result came to pass after the one error by, by the opponent. Sometimes that does happen, but it's a lot less common than you might think. And so there's uh, it's a danger to be avoided. Secondly, let's say we, we can say uh, there's the, the kind of the corresponding fallacy of annotating by a model game or, or being influenced by games looking like a model. So my opponent's play had this very nice flow to it. Everything looked very logical. So it's not just that he won, but that there was this very attractive sequence. You can tell this nice story that I just told, in fact, at the beginning of this, this uh, presentation. But just because it looks like a nice, clean, perfect model, in fact, as we take a closer look, we'll, we'll find some scratches and other imperfections in the, um, in the game. And, and that things are far, far from being so clear. Okay, and the third story is one that's, of course, very familiar to any of us who have bothered to, uh, to to purchase a program, and it's that what the computer can find is often quite remarkable. So let's have a look. All right, so just to zip through the opening moves again, and I pointed out here. Actually, I don't, I don't think I pointed out here. So h3, I think I let pass without comment. Bishop to e3 is a more common move, but h3 is okay. Okay, and then here, both bishop to e3 and a4 are perhaps slight improvements, but bishop to e2 is okay as well, but I would prefer one of the other two moves instead now. Okay, all of this is somewhat normal. a4 again would be okay. And then here, a4 once again. Okay, but bishop to c4, as we'll see, maybe not such a bad move. Interestingly, this position has occurred a fair number of times in the database, um, I mean, not like hundreds of times or anything, but uh, over a dozen times. And interestingly, only one game, besides mine, which isn't in the database, saw the move b5. The main move here is knight to b6. And this was, in fact, played in the, uh, the highest rated game, let's say certainly highest rated if you add both players' ratings. Um, and this is between David Baramidza who at the time was only 23-21, so he, it's, you know, he's, a, he's a grandmaster now. At the time, he was still uh, up and coming. And um, Mikhail Salteyev was black. And this was played in Essen in 2002, and the game was uh, a long, hard-fought draw. Uh, continued like this. Bishop to b3, bishop b6, takes and takes. Queen stepped off the d-file, and black played bishop to f8, which is a very normal move in this um, peer system trying to, to fight for the c5 square, and ultimately black would like to swap off the dark squared bishops and then try to take advantage of d4 and f4 with his knights. Anyway, as I said, this game ended up as a draw. I would assess this position as pretty close to equal. 
maybe white still has a microscopic edge, but it's much closer to, to an equal game than anything else. Uh, another move that's been played here is knight f8. And this is a little bit, little bit cooperative, a little bit passive, but again, fundamentally sound. Black has no real problems here. And this occurred in a game between Dor and Marin Gunic from Graz in 1992. Black won fairly quickly, but certainly not because uh, he has any advantage in this position. So it was simply 250 points higher rated than his opponent, and um, it showed itself in the, uh, the sequel. Okay, but back to b5, which, according to all the commentators that we discussed last week, seems to be fantastic and a refutation of White's play, or at least of White's last move. Um, as I said, this occurred one other time in the database, or I should say once in the database, and in that game between Koziorkova and Golova from Pilsen in 1995, White played bishop to d3, which is an unpleasant move to make, but it does take care of the basic problem. So White no longer has to worry about the e4 pawn, and even though the bishop is passive and it blocks the d file, so what are White's queen and rook doing? Um, you know, sometimes you just got to do what you got to do, and this was at least a, a modest, restrained move, after which, basically, white can't be any more than just a tiny bit worse, if that, and white went on to draw. Okay, so bishop to b3 is, at least it seems to be, a unique move in chess history, uh, which isn't saying much. Okay, every game is going to be unique at some point, uh, unless you're just following book to a draw. But at any rate, the interesting thing about this is that it may be sound. So it's not just unique, but it may be sound. Okay, so a5, this again looked quite um, quite punishing, knight to g5. Okay, here I'll note that black could also consider rook to e7, and the game could go somewhat differently then, but we won't bother exploring that. We'll stick with rook to f8. And now, here I played a3. And even after a3, I'm probably okay, but I have two better moves. One move um, almost gives me an advantage, but with accurate play, black can hold the balance. And I think the other move actually gives me an advantage, objectively speaking, though there are great complications and it uh, isn't easy to prove at all. So if you haven't tried to figure this out on your own over this last week, now is a good time. So I'd recommend stopping the recording at this point and really, really trying hard to find um, some good alternatives for white. And it turns out, as I said, that there are there are two. Okay, well, here comes the first one. As I said, it's not good enough for an advantage, but black has to play quite accurately to maintain the balance. And that move is queen of d6. Okay, so takes is basically forced. Rook takes. And now black has at least three tries. We'll look at three moves. Two of them are attempts to to kind of punish me, to, to be consistent with this plan of bothering my bishop on b3 and going after the e4 pawn. One is more modest. Okay, so let's look at the more ambitious tries first. Okay, so first of all, if h6, okay, that forces me pretty much to go forward. Because if I play knight f3, a4, goodbye bishop. So I have to take, let me take again, and then rook c6. So this gives me the same favorable material advantage as in the game, However, this time, I'm much more active, so here I'm better. And it's crucial that after b4, knight to b5, black cannot play knight takes e4. Why not? So see if you can figure, figure out why. And there are actually at least two reasons why, two good moves for white in this position. Okay, well, the most obvious thing that I think you'll notice very quickly is the possibility of knight to d6 check and knight takes c8. Only problem is this knight on e4, so we just kick it. Very simple. So we play f3. Try to get rid of the, there we go. f3, knight g3, check, takes, and okay, black gets the rook, but we got two pieces for rook out of the deal, and with all of the material um, imbalances back and forth, you might have lost track, but as it turns out, white simply up a pawn, with a dominating position, should be winning. But there's even better than f3, and it's knight to a7. So a funny-looking move, but what does black do about his bishop on c8? He can't protect it, at least not safely, and if he plays bishop to b7, 
then simply rook to c7 with a deadly fork. White just wins here. So uh, after b4, knight to b5, black can't play knight takes e4. But if he can't, then white is just, as I said, clearly better. This bishop is still in danger. We're still threatening knight to d6 or knight to a7. We can consolidate at, at leisure with f3. The rook's ready to come to d1. So white is active, has a small material advantage, and black's coordination is fairly poor. So h6 here is not the solution. Okay, another try might be a4, but this is really going to come to the same thing. Just bishop takes f7, rook f7, knight f7, king f7, rook c6, b4, knight b5, with essentially the same situation. The only difference here is that black's pawn is on a4 rather than on a5, and the pawn is back on h7 rather than on h6. And this doesn't make any difference worth speaking of. So, same thing. Okay, well, if neither h6 nor a4 are good enough to save black to give me quality, what's left? Well, he's got to defend the pawn on c6. And rook a6 looks like the safest way to do it. So, rook a6, I probably have to play something like a3, h6, knight f3. And here with um, patient play, black equalizes. So, I think the best is rook to e8. And, okay, some sequence like this is approximately equal. Um, it is worth noting that b4, which looks quite attractive at first glance, is in fact okay for, for white. So we should play knight to a4. And on the principled knight takes e4, we have rook takes g6. So that's crucial. We're white, white threatening bishop takes h6 now, so king h7 makes sense. Rook g4, threatening the knight. F5 threatens the rook and protects the knight. Rook h4. And let's say f4, bishop c1. And it might seem at first as if black is better. So he's grabbed a central pawn in exchange for a wing pawn. His knight is beautifully located in the center. White's knight is on a4. And we all know that a, rim, a knight on the rim is supposed to be grim or dim. But um, in fact, and also one other thing that looks like it's bad for, for white is this rook on h4. However, white has some trumps too. First, this e5 pawn is a bit weak. Rook e1 may occur. Maybe rook h5 is a follow-up. Uh, another idea for white is bishop c4, threatening to take the rook, and with the idea of playing bishop to d3, trying to exploit this pin. And notice that there can be some tricks like, um, okay, not if there's a knight on e4, but let's say black ends up with a bishop on e4 at some point, so we could have takes, takes, and then knight to g5 check, takes. So there are various tricks that are available, and so white probably has a, a very small edge here. But as I said, if black uh, refrains from playing b4 and plays something like rook to e8, it should be about equal. So ultimately, I think queen to d6, while it at least keeps the balance for white and gives some chances, practically speaking, for an advantage, ultimately it's equal. A second move, though, I think is favorable for white. Though, as I said, it's gonna, it requires a lot of work to show it. And it's a pity I didn't play it. Well, okay, I, I know f for sure that I wouldn't have found all of the moves that I'm going to show you now. But it is a move I at least considered, and it's certainly a move that was in my style. So f4, just continuing to play aggressively, not caring about h6, not caring about a4 or b4, just going for it. And, uh, you know, this is very much in the style of tall. So you, you launch pieces over at the opponent's king side, and the, the, the hope when you do it is that, okay, they can attack your pieces and occasionally even take them, but as tall points out, they can only take them one at a time. So maybe he gets one of my pieces, but if I've got so many pieces being flung at the opponent, good things can often happen. And as we'll see, they will happen in this variation. Okay, well, first of all, Let's see what happens if black just plays e takes f4, just grabs the pawn. Then bishop takes f4, check, bishop e3, keeping keeping the uh, the pace going. Queen c7, knight f7, rook or a4. Okay, if rook f7 comes to the same thing, it doesn't really matter if the pawn is on a4 or on a5. So just throwing it in there for the sake of uh, letting you see the extra possibility for black. Okay, and now here, 
the material is pretty good for black. So he's got two pieces for a rook and a pawn. If he can just get his king to g8, he's probably in good shape. So what should white play in this position? Well, the answer is a little tactic. Knight takes b5. And this gives black uh, some real problems. White's clearly better because if c takes b5, queen to d5 check, and we pick up the rook, after which we're winning. Okay, of course, black doesn't have to take, but if he doesn't, then white's still in very good shape. Rook and two pawns now for the um, two minor pieces, plus black's queenside pawn structure is now messed up. Got an isolated, well, two isolated pawns there, plus the knight's ready to come into d6. So black is in trouble here. So e takes f4 is not very good. Okay, how about h6? Now, this is a more interesting move. Okay, so after h6, bishop takes f7, rook f7, takes, takes, f takes e5, and now both recaptures come into consideration. Let's start with knight takes e5. What should white play in this position? Well, if you said knight takes b5, you get mostly full points, so you get almost full credit. So this is a good move. And it's good for the exact same reason that we already saw, namely if c takes b5, queen to d5 check, and queen takes a8. And of course, if um, he doesn't take, then again, we've got a good material situation anyway, and the knight's ready to come into d6. And the pawn on h6 is hanging too, so uh, we have even that little benefit to add on top of it. Nevertheless, white has an even better move than knight takes b5, and it's knight to d5. So first of all, if c takes d5, it's the exact same thing. Queen d5 and queen takes a8. So just the same. In fact, it's exactly the same because uh, the pawn, we, we, in both cases, white won a pawn and black ends up with a pawn on b5. It's just, it occurs by a different, different means. So you can see this is the same as this. Okay. But the key is what happens if black doesn't take. So in the knight takes b5 line, if black doesn't take, white still has a big advantage, but it's even bigger here. So for instance, queen to d8, knight takes f6. Okay, black has to play queen takes d2. Rook takes d2, bishop f6, but then rook d to f2. The only way to defend the bishop for uh, with any hope is knight to d7, but then bishop to d4 takes away the hope black can resign. He's going to be down the exchange and a pawn with no compensation whatsoever. So after h6, takes, 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 fe5, we just saw that knight takes e5 is no good. On queen takes e5, we play bishop to d4, and now black has a choice between two kinds of retreats. So there are e-file retreats, and there's queen to b8. So let's take a look at one of the queen, the uh, e-file retreats with queen to e8. So see if you can figure out what white should do against this. So I think white has a fairly clear-cut win against this. It starts with e5. Clearly black has to take. Now queen e3. Again, black has no choice here. If you play something like knight to c4, and then we just take and play bishop f6. So knight e to d7 is forced to keep the knight adequately protected, the knight on f6 adequately protected. But now, knight e4 is a real pain in the neck. Not only are we loading up on the knight on f6, but we're also threatening knight to d6 check, picking up the queen. So let's say queen to e6. Well, now rook d to e1, threatening knight to g5 check, and then queen takes e6. So king f8 steps out of the way, but now knight f6 check, or not, not, not check, but it wins. Black's queen is hanging, and after he takes, simply rook e3, White wins the piece, or keeps the piece that he's just won, and again is up the exchange, and black has no compensation. So white is winning here. Okay, so after bishop to d4, we just look to queen to e8. If queen to b8, black at least avoids the troubles on the e-file, but still, his position is bad, and white's clearly better, though probably not winning yet, after queen e3, threatening e5, king g8, e5, and then queen e4, with the fork of these two pawns, and let's say king h7, queen takes c6, and white is clearly better. So rook and two pawns for two minor pieces, 
but white is very active. You can see that black has, um, first of all, is far from finishing with his development. <coughs> Excuse me. And all of his pieces are passive. And his king is not very good either. So white has a serious advantage here. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay, so after f4, we've just dispensed with e takes f4 and h6. Let's look at a third try, and this leads to some really neat variations. b4. So this is the most consistent approach for black, trying to, uh, to take advantage of his own trumps here and show that I'm overextended. So knight a4, and now black has a choice between two moves. There's bishop to a6, and we'll see why that's useful in a moment, and h6. And let's start with h6. So h6, knight f7 is forced. I mean, if I go back to f3, he just plays knight takes e4, and I have no compensation. So knight f7, go forward, rook f7. And here, white makes a fantastic move. All right, so if you can find this one, hats off to you. That is, if you can find it without switching on Fritz or Ribka or Shredder or one of these programs. So I, I don't know. I, I think maybe a very strong Grandmaster could find it working really hard at the board. Um, but as we saw, I mean, really strong Grandmasters, or at least one really strong Grandmaster, from the comfort of his own living room, didn't even come close to finding it. So this would be a real achievement. Well, the move is this. It's not bishop takes f7. It's not f takes e5. It's not f5. It's not something crazy like knight to b6 or even knight c5. The move is queen to d3. A little creeping move. Now, before we go on, you might want to even stop here and try to figure out what exactly the point of this move is. Well, here's the answer. If it's white to move here, we play bishop takes f7, king f7, queen to b3 check. Okay, now black has two retreats for the king. If he goes to e7... Then knight to c5 is very strong, threatening queen to e6, at least. Um, and if knight f8, then f takes e5, queen e5, bishop d4, say queen g5, and now takes, takes, and e5, which is a very nice killing blow. If the bishop moves anywhere, if it takes the pawn, retreats, whatever, then we have mate in one. And if queen takes, e5, then if nothing else, we can just pick up the queen, probably use this rook, and that's game over as well. So, very nice concluding combination, but not really surprising. Okay, if king f8 on the other hand, um, okay, so here the computer informs me that the fastest win is queen to e6. What I was able to work out on my own was the following. So, knight to c5, I mean, this is what I worked out from back after queen to d3. So knight c5. Okay, now, if knight to b6, one simple way to win is this. fe5, queen e5, bishop d4. And unless black just wants to give away the knight, in which case he's dead lost, he should play either queen e7 or queen g5, but even so, e5. So it doesn't matter. Either he gives up the knight straight away, or he gives it up after e5. So knight to b6 isn't so challenging. But knight takes c5, is more entertaining. So bishop c5 check, king e8, f takes e5, queen e5, bishop d4. Okay, again, if black gives up the knight, he's just lost, so we should look at continuations where he tries to keep it. If queen e7, then takes, takes, queen g8, queen f8, and now you could trade queens and play rook f6, but it's even better to just play rook to d8, after which black loses everything. If instead queen to g5, then we play like this. Bishop f6, check, check. Okay, if king e6 now, rook to d6. So queen c7. Again, if the king comes up, we play rook to d6 and take the bishop, if nothing else. So king g8. And now see if you can figure out the most efficient way of concluding the game. Okay, well, the best way to do it, certainly the fastest, is this. Rook to d8 check, 
queen f7, queen f8, and rook f7. And it's quite a useful little trick, and it's not a computer thing. I mean, I found this pretty easily. So uh, it's a good thing to know because this kind of pattern actually does, does occur sometimes. Not necessarily with the rook sacrifice on d8, but this um, two major pieces getting the king on h7 trick uh, is, is one that I've seen before. Okay, so we go back, 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 and the point is the white has a real threat here. Okay, so now let's look at a couple of black defenses. So one try might be knight to f8. Against this, it looks like the best way to go is knight to b6, and after rook to b8, to just trade and just take this guy. If queen takes f8, uh, f7, then f takes e5 wins the piece on the pin. I guess I can show that real quick. So that's obviously winning. Whoops. And if king takes f7, okay, then fe, bishop d4, and again, e5 is winning. So white's going to be the exchange in the pawn ahead, and we'll have a better position to boot. So knight f 8s no good. But now finally, well, what about bishop to a6? I mean, this looks like this ought to be good. Well, this is going to be similar to what we saw um, in the previous variation where I showed what white's threat was. So we take queen check, knight c5. And, okay, if knight takes c5, this is even easier because with the bishop not on c8 anymore, we just do this and it's mate next move. So black should try a4. And now there are plenty of things that white can do to enjoy a winning advantage. One is knight takes d7. If queen takes d7, then queen takes b4 check, and then we take the queen next move. And if knight takes, then queen e6, threatens the knight, and threatens f takes e5 when black's king is in a mating net. So this is hopeless for black as well. Even if he plays bishop f1, rook takes d7, the material is going to be too much for uh, black to handle. Okay, actually, I'll, let me demonstrate this, just for the sake of showing some mating patterns. So queen d7, and, and we don't even bother to take the queen. We play bishop c5. That's mate. Or if queen e7, then we use another standard mating pattern. can go either way. can do this the greedy way and pick up black's bishop on the way to mate. Okay, so now we see after knight to a4, that h6 fails because of this really brilliant idea with queen to d3. So let's try another move for black, and that's bishop to a6, which looks pretty good. So it stops queen to d3, hits the rook. There's a drawback as always, though. Okay, rook f2, h6, knight f7, takes, 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 fe5. Okay, and now, because the bishop's on a6, Queen takes e5 can't be played anymore because of queen takes d7. <laughs> Bad luck. So, after f takes e5, black has to play knight takes e5. And even here, white's winning, but it requires some very fancy stepping. So, we'd like to put some more pressure on this knight on f6. Whoops. But how do we do it? We can't play rook d to f1. We can't play bishop to g5. And bishop to d4 doesn't let the bishop hop over the knight on e5? Well, the answer is just this. We play bishop to b6, and then bishop to d8. Very cute. Queen e8, knight c5, bishop c4, b3, bishop e6, and now we pile on. Boom. Now, there are other ways that black could try to defend, but He's losing in every case, so I'll, I'll let you work those lines out for yourself. The basic bottom line here is that because black can't play queen takes e5 here, but has to play knight takes e5 instead, he ends up being rather loose in his uh, defensive ranks, and white can take advantage of this. So, it looks as if, remarkably, f4 is very, very strong. Uh, either winning, maybe you're close to winning. It's a little hard to believe, but... It, it looks like that's the case. I mean, black just doesn't have enough development, and everything is just a little bit too weak. I mean, he has problems on f7, 
His knights are sometimes underprotected, and he has problems on e5 as well. So, if this is right, then it looks like, in fact, what I played may actually be really good. Uh, again, black can probably improve with rook to e7, but even here, uh, white seems to be at least a little bit better. So, very interesting, very surprising. Um, I would say you should look at rook to e7 more carefully and see if black can maybe slowly neutralize white's initiative. Anyway, after rook f8, I played a3. So I missed, missed a nice chance there. Although, again, I think the odds of my finding queen to e3 there were quite small. Anyway, a3, h6, takes, takes. This is all still the game. b4. And then here I played queen to g5, which went unremarked upon, except that, again, the annotators... All like to put a diagram here because it's, it has this very flashy situation where, again, if black takes my knight on c3, I play queen takes g6, and I'm winning. However, uh, it's a mistake. And the best would have been to play a takes b4, and then knight to e2. Okay, first point. If knight takes e4, queen b4, takes, takes, say king g7 getting out of the pin and protecting the g6 pawn, takes, takes, and now f4. And white has a real initiative here. Black's best is probably to give up another pawn here to get into an ending where he's got two bishops for a rook and three pawns. And it's a tribute to how powerful bishops are that white's advantage is... White does have an advantage, but it's not close to, to fatal yet for black. But still, white's better here. Okay, so that's on knight takes e4. If black instead plays knight to c5... Okay, this is better, but even here, white's okay. Takes, takes, queen takes b4. And, okay, in this position, white is still a little bit better. Not much, but my queen side is okay. I have a majority on both sides. And I don't have the kinds of positional problems that I had in the game. So it looks as if even my, my a3 move was okay for at least equality and, and maybe some small advantage. Okay, well in the game I played queen g5. Show off he move. Knight c5, takes, 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 takes. And here I played queen to e3. Maybe even here a takes b4 is a little bit better. And then after f3, okay, if he plays knight to d6, I take, and I'm even slightly better. He should play knight to d5. But now, takes, takes, and here, material is even. Black's position is definitely a little bit better. His bishop is better than my knight. His center pawns, as long as they're safe, are quite strong because they're center pawns and they're on the best possible squares. And, at least for the moment, his rook maybe has some prospects of, of penetrating on the queen side. So black is a little bit better, but, but not much. Okay, well, I play queen to e3. Here, maybe black could have improved with bc and then cb. So I have to go through some work regaining the pawn and um, I think maybe black has a slightly bigger advantage in this position than he could have had in the game. So he played knight to e6. Again, I should have just traded. I didn't do this because I thought that giving him the open a file would be really detrimental, but I underestimated, of course, the kinds of things that happened later where my split pawns were weak and um, when I played c3 to keep his knight out, it again allowed um, him to ruin my pawn structure and gave him that nice hole on b3 for his, his pieces. So here, and then rook to a1, it's pretty close to equal. In fact, again, maybe I'm a tiny bit better here. So it's unfortunate. I was afraid of his rook using the a-file, but it really doesn't achieve anything just yet. So too bad. And I think rook to a2 doesn't do anything here. Well, for one thing, I can just play rook to a1, if nothing else. Well, okay, actually, I'm not completely sure about that. I think that's right. Yeah, because after rook takes b2, it's not that rook a7 wins, because he has bishop to b7, but that I have queen to c1. And, of course, I can combine the two, but maybe plays queen b6. Well, even there, I could play rook takes b7. So whether I play, play it like that, or I think much more simply with queen to c1, white's just winning here. So if he can't take on b2, then there's nothing to really be afraid of on the a-file. 
So, oh well. And um, maybe I could also play queen to b3. This might be possible too. Let's say he plays queen a5, and then I play rook to d6. So we can see that this a file is, at least at the moment, not really a serious threat. All right, so I played knight to e2, bishop a6, rook fe1, c5, and even here I'm okay if I play, I think, rook to d2. So I'm not positive that I'm okay, but I think I'm okay. So for instance, knight to d4, knight g3, and his knight looks beautiful, but I'm not really sure what it does. And I also have possibilities of maybe playing queen g5 and knight f5 check if he gets a little uh, frisky on the queen side. So bishop takes e2, queen e2, let's say c4, queen e3, c3, takes, takes, rook d3. And it looks dangerous for me, but I'm not sure that he can break through. So rook c8, let's say I play here. And now if he plays knight to d4, I can sack the exchange back, and I'm perfectly good here. So I'm at least equal in this position. Three pawns for the piece, beautiful centralization, and his c3 pawn is a little bit weak. Okay, queen c5 is maybe better, but okay, I just trade, play f3, and all right, he can play knight to d4, and this looks pretty pretty bad for me at first sight, because I can't play rook c1 on account of knight, takes, uh, knight to e2 check, but king f2 is fine. And now, okay, it's equal, and if he plays knight takes c2, I'm even better. Rook c1, take, 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 and I'm going to win his a pawn. And because he has weak pawns on the, on the king side, I have at least very small chances. I mean, objectively, this is, this is just a draw. Uh, the computer thinks that white is maybe even close to winning, but that, that's nonsense. I mean, it's almost 100% a draw. But still, the only person who has any chances is, is white here. Not, not my opponent. And also there may be some small question about his knight on b1 reaching safety. So maybe that could be a reason. But, but I think he can play knight to d2. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, actually, no, maybe I am better if he can't defend this pawn easily. So knight to d2, for instance, takes here, here. And that's trouble. So... Yeah, maybe in fact white does have a serious advantage, depending on what black does with this e5 pawn. If he can save that and not let his knight on b1 get trapped. All right, so the point is, white certainly has no trouble at all here, and has some some winning chances. Maybe black can find some way of taking care of everything, but even then, white still has minor winning chances. And meanwhile, maybe he, black has some real problems with those two uh, issues to be taken care of. So the point is, okay, that wasn't forced, of course, so we can go back to here. Black does not have to play knight takes c2. I mean, the position is about even here. But the point is just that white is holding on. White is okay. Okay, so I played c3. This is a mistake. However, takes, takes, bishop c4, rook b1, rook b8. There's no reason why I had to allow him to play a4 and then rook to b3. And if I just take here, it's still not clear at all. So takes. Now, I didn't like to give up the b-file, but after knight to c1, it's not clear that he can do anything with it. For instance, if he plays queen to b2, I just play knight to d3. And I'm going to play knight takes c5 if he plays queen takes c3. And I have no problems there. Uh, if he plays queen takes a3, I play knight takes e5. I'm happy with that as well. And if he plays bishop takes d3, I don't really mind that either, because then he gets rid of his best piece. See, if I have this rook versus two knights situation, then I'm okay, because his knights really don't function that well just yet. So this is okay for me. Let's say he plays queen to d6 instead, preventing knight to d3. Okay, I play f3, a4, knight e2. And I'm passive here by comparison, but again, black has to prove it. Uh, I've got everything covered, and, um, you know, my rook can go to b1 or to d1. He can't keep both lines um, closed, or he can't, he can't occupy both files with his queen. So I still have reasonable chances here. Um, th the basic point of all of this, and this is kind of a, a rule of thumb, and like all rules of thumb, there are many exceptions, but it's useful. And it's this, that in a position where you have material uh, material imbalance, like, like you do here, where I have a rook and pawns for a couple of minor pieces, 
it's often a good idea to give your opponent fewer kinds of pieces. In other words, black has four kinds of pieces here. He has a queen, he has a bishop, he has knights, and he has rooks. Well, a rook. Okay. Um, whereas I have three kinds of pieces. A queen, a rook, well, rooks, and, and knights. So by playing rook takes b8, I'm getting rid of one kind of piece for him while I still have that sort of piece myself. So I'm not sure what the best way to explain it. I mean, you could say that there's a synergy between different kinds of pieces, and by um, getting rid of that, I, I reduce his chances. While I still have the possibility of using a rook with other pieces. Anyway, this would have given me chances still to hold. Okay, f3, a4, and again, rook to b8 takes b8. I still have some chances to hold. And maybe I'm not even much worse. Maybe it's even close to equal. I think I'm, I should be a little bit worse, but it's not fatal yet by any means. So only after g3, rook to b3. Now, finally, I probably am lost, or at least close to lost. Uh, even here, maybe rook takes b3 is a better try. So takes, takes, and then blockading with the rook would have been better. So I, I'm still in bad shape, but... It's not, it's not yet trivial, and the reason is that uh, he wants to play something like bishop takes, he wants to move his bishop and play the pawn to c4, so his knight can come to c5 and into d3. But it's not really easy for him to, to do this. Okay, his bishop can't retreat anywhere because then he loses the b-pawn. Uh, if he tries moving the knight from e6 so he can retreat the bishop, he drops the c-pawn. And if he plays bishop takes e2, queen takes e2, and he still can't play c4 because my queen would take it. So black still has some work to do here. He's definitely better. My position is definitely unpleasant, but it's not lost just yet. Okay, it's only after queen c1, okay, and, and the, the ensuing moves. Now I'm, I'm just busted because he gets what he needs, and here's where I resigned. Okay, so what can we say about this now having taken a closer look? It turns out the game is much more interesting. It was a battle of some ideas. And, okay, really it's a, a question of missed opportunities on my part. So his play was, was quite logical and there was a nice flow to it. But it wasn't this sort of one-sided um, deal that we had the impression from last week and that I had the impression of for, for many years. Uh, in fact, White had some, some real chances, though they would have required um, very uh, active, very energetic and, and accurate play. Um, and then even later with let's say, more moderate play, I would have been okay. So I made some misjudgments, first about playing a takes b4, and then later about making the rook exchange. So I think this is, uh, let's say, a typical sort of game between um, good, but you know, maybe not great players, but, but certainly good players, um, that they're, it, it may seem like it's very, very clean, but uh, we, we, we make mistakes just like everybody else. So maybe uh, maybe Ripka versus uh, Fritz nowadays, you won't have a game like this, but at least at, at human levels, even pretty decent human levels, even what looks like a very clean game often is uh, far, far messier. So it's um, it could be discouraging in one sense that even pretty good players don't really play as well as you might think they do, but it's also encouraging because it shows just how rich the game is, and also how many chances there are. So, um, you know, I had a lot of places where I could have really made things messy and against a really outstanding player. So, um, anyway, take from it what you will. I, I found it fascinating. I, I find the game fascinating on really both levels, both um, the very clean level, the, the illusion, the illusion um, that we had from last week, and also in this uh, much more detailed um, examination as well. So I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed both and um, the kind of meta lesson about being careful about how you annotate and interpret a game and, um, and enjoyed the game as well. So thanks a lot and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.